If you want to drop me a line, Kate Gorman in Whitehall Road. Very short, very brief, very succinct, very to the point. Dear Ian, always a good start. She says, please, please, please send me a signed photo. Lots of luck, Kate. What more? Oh, right over there, you'll see. What more can we say? What more can we say? Right over there. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. Well, we were promised them this week. You will have all heard the programme, not the programme director, he's a... He's my boss, he's a lovely person, and a wonderful, warm human being, and not him at all. Uh, yeah, him, that, that scam, what's his name, that Gary in the um, promotions department, he said they'd be here this week, and they're not. And it's not just me who's missed about it, and it's not just you who's missed about it. Why, street bike in Dudley, a fine place to go and buy your motorcycle from, that's what I'd say. Well, they're missed about it as well, because they paid for the things. Anyway, there should be a... Uh, oh, any minute now we're expecting somebody to come through the door with them. As soon as we got them, we'll send them out. Can't say further than that. But don't have them, can't send them. The Dwarf sent me um, a postcard. I thought it was uh, from Puerto Rico. Well, it says Puerto Rico on the back, but Puerto Rico is sort of like... not in the Canary Islands. Well, it is now according to the, uh, the postmark. There's a, you see, authentic stamp, unstamped, of King Carlos. For uh, 45 potatoes. How much it cost him to send this? It's a beautiful view of, um, um, well, a volcanic mountain, really. Anyway, it says, here's the card you asked for. They celebrate Xmas out here, 6th of January. Sensible people, beats the rush, you see. Weather low 80s, hasta la vista, I'll be back before this card. Off to the bar now for a pint. All the best, the dwarf. Posted 23rd of December, and we just got it. Jay, she writes, Dear Ian, never mind all this antibiotics stuff and drugs. <laughs> what drugs? Get yourself round to my place, Ew, double air, for an aromatherapy treatment and massage. <laughs> That's an offer a boy can't refuse. Essential oils are decrimin something or other. Um, discriminating, that was it. They only kill the baddies. If your girlfriend's not happy, Bring her along for one too. Also, that help with skin conditions. Take care, Jane. Oh, Midnight Line listener for six years. It's about compensation, Jane. You can have to see my solicitor. Thanks for that. Dear Ian, flame grilled whopper Perry. He writes this stuff. Miss Louise Savage says that I'm writing to request one of your superb and most sought after photographs. This letter is short and sweet because I know you're a busy little boy. You're also a naughty little boy for taking up smoking again, and I shall have to put you over my knee. Whoa! Well, send my photo uh, uh, well, over your knee. Send my photo soon, please, Petal. Love and hugs, kiss, kiss, Lulu. That's Lulu Savage. Any other women want to send me um, any disgraceful suggestions about what they'd like to do with my body? Um, you know, I've already had the why don't you donate it to medical science at 267 Technol Road in Wolverhampton, 28 Castle Street in Shrewsbury. Ever get the feeling tonight is going to be just one of those shows? But sort of show that you, your mother had in mind when she said, don't go on the wireless, son, you're going to have nights like this. We'll find out. Vicky. Ian. Good morning. Good morning, oh, Ian. God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a hard not going to be that bad, Ian. It's a hard life, isn't it's it? It's not going to be that bad. Because somebody's got to do it. <laughs> and I was that man. When they said, we're thinking of doing a phone show, anybody want to do it? I said, yes. I'll you do just happened it. to walk into the room at the wrong time. I stood at a bus stop, actually. <laughs> boss come back and said, hey, hey, you, you ever worked on the radio before? I said, no. Do you want to do a phone show? You're mm -hmm. qualified. <laughs> yeah, you'll do. <laughs> Manny stands at bus stop. Why not? What can we do for you this fine morning? Hypnosis. Yes. Yes. What, you want to learn, do you? Well, yes, I'm that. It costs you a lot of money. Loads of money. Lot of credit. Well, it does cost you a lot of money, usually. However, people who switch off at two o'clock, you see, Boring people. They're missing out. Boring people. Because after two o'clock, we're giving away. We're giving away. Give, give, give till it hurts. That's our motto in and our beautiful superstore. For only 150 credits. You can become a hypnotist. Well, there you go. And we'll send you on a course. With Zippo or something. Oh, no, Zappa, that was <laughs> it, wasn't it? Zappa. He's a, a well-known hypnotist, apparently. Well done, Ian. <laughs> and uh, Zippo, Zappa, sorry, he'll, uh, he'll teach you to be a hypnotist. Usually it costs you in excess of a thousand pounds, but you can win it on this particular a friend, show. A friend of mine has taken a leaf out of your book. She keeps calling him Slapper. Slapper. That's an even better one. Thank you for that. So he's a friend of mine. I, I like annoying him. His stage name is, his stage name is Zappa. 
Yeah. Which is quite a good stage name if you're a hypnotist, because if anybody asks, anybody asks him why he's killed Zachary, he goes, I'll show you. Zap, zap, zap. And he sends people to sleep. Well, he does that before the act started. Yeah, he does that for me. And uh, I, I like thinking of variations on it, like Zippo or Zippy or Zipper or Slap is an excellent one. I have to use that. Any old way up, that's what you can win. Ask the light, your own hypnotist course. Could I just trouble you, Mr. James? Can you put these lights on? Because I'm working in the dark here, lovey, and Aww. I'm scared of the dark because I'm a big Aww. car. Do you want someone to hold a hand in? Oh, uh, no, you're all right. I thought I was scared of the dark. You're very kind, Jim. That was the back lighting. Could you just put that switch down there as well? And we got front lighting. We got the well work. Done, Ian. Thank you very much. Well done. Just like waking up. Right, okay. Sorry. Thanks, Jim. You're very kind. No, you're all right. We'll keep the door shut. <laughs> Well, I'll keep the absolutely homicidal maniacs out. Oh, fair enough. Right, um, yes, where were we? We were talking about hypnotism. Hypnotism. Indeed. Yes. You know that Central Weekend are talking about hypnotism tomorrow night, don't you? Apparently. Yes. Apparently. They're not slow, are they? No. They're well, not slow, they're in reverse. Well, would you believe they asked 15 women to go in tonight to be hypnotised? Did they? To the point of orgasm. But hold on a minute. Hold on, hold on for a minute. Well, oh well, we'll talk about orgasms. I don't mind. No, it's an adult no. show. <laughs> but wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. Isn't Santa live? Live? No. And not, isn't it on? Not the recorded Friday, bits on. Isn't it on Friday night? Not the recorded bits on. Right, no, I'm shocked. Why don't they call themselves Central Almost Live? Except the recorded bits. Yes. <laughs> That's what Don't they should call get it all on the phone, okay? Yeah, would you just make the writing smaller? <laughs> Central live, almost live, apart from the recorded bits. Well, I feel very let down, for one, because yeah, I truly believe that it was all live. And now you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Central Live is Exclusive not live. From Vicky. Exclusive is not live because they record bits of it. I'm ve I feel very let down. Yes, very I let do down. When? You don't, you don't believe it. They actually record that rubbish, do they? They record the bits that they have to sort of edit. Ah, yeah, well, you see, I think... Like, you're rolling man on the floor in, you know organism. what? Organism. Organism, that's it. <laughs> I think I think what they probably do is, uh, I don't know how long it lasts, say an hour, they probably record the entire hour on a Thursday night. Uh, it gets to Friday and think, oh, God, we have to edit this. How long we got left, then, that we can <laughs> use? Um, a minute. probably going on tomorrow night as well. One minute. Oh, you're on Central Live? <laughs> wow, Central Almost Live, apart from the recorded bit. Yes. So did they, um, they had a hypnotist in? From they had a hypnotist in. And was he any good? <laughs> oh, he was brilliant, Ian. He really put us all under. You're saying he didn't, aren't you? He put one girl in a panic fit, Ian. Oh dear, there's nothing worse than somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Well, yeah. actually, there is. There's two people who don't know what they're doing is worse than one well, people. Well, you know how susceptible I am, because you've seen it. I've seen lampposts hypnotise you, Vicky, yes. <laughs> well, um, he couldn't put me under. <laughs> he calls himself a hypnotist. What's his name? Do you think I ought to say it? Why not? He's going to be on the telly tomorrow, isn't it? Dr. Hypnogasm. Dr. Hypnogasm. James Hennessy. Doctor wants to learn what he's doing. And he even bought a planted subject. Oh, how do you know that? Because he brought, she walked in with him and she's got no clothes on. Well, well, except for one piece of material, really. So it's going to be worth watching tomorrow night, <laughs> if just for that. And guess who she didn't put under as well? Go on. He's planted. You're joking. I'm not, honest to God. He couldn't even put his planted subjects under. Oh, well, I look forward to this with interest. <laughs> and this Me one and girl, the boy Zapper. What he... <laughs> I'm yet to phone him and tell him about it. I've spoken to his wife, actually. He's married. <laughs> but he said I was the only one. Anyway, sorry, yeah, go on. <laughs> anyway, um, we were sitting there and we were all supposedly under. He stood this man in front of us how and did said he was... And, how did he try and hypnotise you? He... You know how Zappa does it one-on-one? -on -one? Well, well, I think that takes something... <laughs> to be fair to his lovely wife, I think we ought to explain that a bit. Um, <laughs> well, yes, he I did. He, 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 yes, he tried to do a... He tried to do a mass one, didn't yes. he? Yes. Sure. About did he, did 15 give, or 16 women. Did he give you any susceptibility tests? No. Were you asked before you went to the studio if you'd ever been hypnotised before? Um, by the researchers, yes. By him, no. Yeah, that's okay if the researchers did it. So he obviously thought he had 16 easy, easy, peasy ones. No, all the rest have never been hypnotised. Oh. I was the only one. And he, he didn't do any tests of any sort? No. Bright guy. And what he did with this woman was, she, we were all sitting there in a nice little semicircle, and she was under. He actually put two people under. Right? And he picked this, the one of them up, started talking to her while he was supposed to be putting us under. 
prepared you feel and all that business. And then he said she wasn't under and sent her out of the room. She just started panicking. She freaked out. She was screaming like mad. Well, I suppose they do attract drama queens, don't they? Well, Things yeah. like this. Well, she, they had to call paramedics. What for? She was hyperventilating. She couldn't breathe. She was turning blue. Nice to know there's some decent practitioners around, allegedly. Yeah. Um, it scared me. It really did scare me. Well, folks, if you want to learn how to do it properly, we're giving away a course <laughs> after two o'clock. Maybe if Dr. What, uh, what's his face? Hypnogasm. Dr. Hypnogasm. Or Hypnogasm or something like that. Maybe if you want to learn to do it properly, Dr. Hypnogasm, whatever your name is, then you should tune in after two because we're giving a course away. We'll teach you how to do it properly. Yeah. And, um, right, I, I just couldn't believe it. It was rubbish. I mean, I've been, you know how many times I've been hypnotised by Zappa. Well, how many times has the sun come up in the past, um... <laughs> I've been done about seven or eight times now. Yeah, what about the hypnotism? And I've been... <laughs> <laughs> Never want to miss the cheap shot! <laughs> well, no, I've been done a lot more than that, but that's beyond the, <laughs> beyond the point. <laughs> so, is, uh, you, you reckoned it was a load of rubbish? Mm-hmm. Did he actually get any women to fake orgasms? No. Oh dear. Because I've been boldly we... proclaiming that this is what's going to happen tomorrow night. Maybe they should send for Zappa. That's what I said. Yes, yeah, send for he's Zappa. Brilliant. You know, he's excellent. I mean, I've never seen anybody get anyone to do weird things like he can do to me. No, well, you see, we, we came to the conclusion, me and Zapp, as I call him, because he's my mate, you see, so you can call him Zapp. We come to the conclusion that there's probably two people in the Western world who should not possess the knowledge. Ian of... and Zappa. Yeah, me and him. Yeah, we shouldn't know how to do it. <laughs> It's, it's an absolute dreadful state of affairs that we know how to do it, and I think it ought to be licensed, it ought to be regulated to stop people like us knowing how to do it. Yeah, but he, I, I mean, I'm, I am biased because I think Zappa is a brilliant hypnotist, because of, he's just got a disgusting imagination. He's just got a filthy mind. I <laughs> know, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> but the things he gets people to do... Um, by the way, he's on at the Star, it's just not... On Sunday night. Oh, right. Home, publicise anything. Home territory. Where is it? The Star? Yeah, the Star. Which one's that? I don't know. I think it's called Oddfellas as well. Oh, um, in Shifnal? Yeah. Oh, right. Well, I might have a buzz down there because I'm off Sunday night. I'm there. I'm going. All oh, right. So your chance to meet Vicky, folks. <laughs> and see Zappo and his filthy imagination. Yeah. By the way, tell him the invoice is in the post for this. Fair enough. I want pain as well for this. But, um, yeah, I'm going on tomorrow night as well. All oh, right, well, we'll all look forward hopefully, to that. Hopefully, hopefully, unless they're listening to this, me bad-mouthing them. <laughs> what do you mean, as if, if they're listening? Where do you think they get their ideas for subjects from? Well, true, true. Um, oh, you'll be able to watch they that. They seem to follow you about a week behind, don't they? Well, I love that bit at the beginning. The only bit I like, the only bit I watch on Central Live is the beginning when the presenters walk out like they've got a broom shoved up the bums. <laughs> Have you seen it? It's really funny. It's the only way they can get the set clean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, how much are we paying this lot? We might as well get them to sweep up while they're walking. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Vicky, we've got to move on, but yeah. we will wait with bated breath yes, to see what is. happens tomorrow night. So if I don't phone in, you know why I'm on my way back from Brum. Okie dokie. <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Lovely. To her. Okay, bye. There we go, Vicky. Uh, Central Live tomorrow night. Well, that sounds like it's going to be a bit of a washout, doesn't it? Sack the researchers, that's what I say. It's a free-for-all on the Midnight Line, 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. We're going to go to a commercial break, but not yet, because we're going to speak to Brenda first, then we'll go to a commercial break, and then I'll we'll answer your phone lines. That's fair enough, isn't it? Hello, Brenda. Hello. Hello, Brenda. Have you taken all your antibiotics? Yes. I went and had the job. To what? The of the doctor? Yeah. They can get stuck off for that, Brenda. Can they? Oh, sorry, the injection. Inject. Yeah. Sorry, 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 yes. sorry, sorry. Yes, I had the prick in my arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> the news of the world shall hear about this. Well, yeah. Well... Instead of, so you can get that instead of antibiotics, can you? Yep. Oh, that sounds... Mind you, it makes you feel a little bit groggy. A little? Well, mine, I'll tell you, Brenda. Brenda, I was off the planet, I was. Well, actually, I have been since Monday when I had it. You know, legs, arms, everywhere is ached. It's a good feeling. It saves you to go down the pub, doesn't it? I mean, normally I have to go to down the pub and part with an enormous amount of money to feel like that. I'll rather drink. Oh, well, that's how you feel, Brenda. Is it? Yeah, that's well, what you're missing out on. Well... Except, of course, you're not getting a headache in the morning. I don't know. You get all sorts of aches. What's, what's happening to you, then, with these antibiotics? No, you just have the needle and... Um, you had a prick in the arm, as you say. Yes. So graphically put it, yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, right, my mum isn't listening. Mind you, mind you, she says you won't feel nothing. I says no. I says usually, you know what they told you, A B C. You it's, may you may feel a small prick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, all all you you don't. It's impact. Uh, once it's worn off, direct it is good. What so, what are they giving it you for? It's a flu jab. Oh, one of these before you actually get it. Yep. Things. Mm. Um, yes, I'd, I'd, I'd um, take my chances. It wasn't, I didn't actually have flu. No, but the thing is, there's I such a lot of the people they're expecting another swarm of it coming over, so I would get down there and get one. Another swarm of flu? It was Beijing flu last time, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it's Chinese flu coming over now. Well, I, I heard that it was um, Russian flu. You break out in little red squares. <laughs> Trust you. Oh no, there's only one, isn't there? How's that bike going? I don't know because um, I woke up on Wednesday. I was meant to go and pick it up. Oh. On, on Wednesday, and I nominate myself as Jesse of the Year. Oh yes. Because I woke up and I looked out the window and it was pelting down with rain. I thought, oh, no, I don't want too warm in here. I don't you want don't to go want and get wet. wet. You big Jesse Perry. So I'll, I'll pick it up at the weekend, and I promise to be careful on it and obey the highway code. And not drive over 30 miles an hour, ride over 30 miles an hour, all stuff like that. Make it 60 and be done with it. I promise to be a good boy on this motorcycle. Yeah. I will admit, I'll be the first to admit, Brenda, that I was a bad boy on other motorcycles. And sometimes did 35 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour limit. Yeah. But on this motorcycle, I swear to be a good boy. Oh yeah. And never to exceed the speed limit. That's good and, of you. Yeah, it is good of me. And stuff like that. And to be polite to Volvo drivers. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got a Fiat Regatta, one of the eighty-five S. Eh? Well, it's not a, it's not a Volvo. It's That's a very the main nice thing. car, though. Anyway, Ian, the reason I rang you yes. is now I've got a husband that on the last day of September had a nasty accident at work, and um, unfortunately he just gets a little bit of statutory sick pay from work to which income support allows £16 to make it up for the amount of £69. In the meantime, I've had my washer blow up on me. I've Never got no, rains, does it, Brenda? No, I've got no fridge, I've got no hoover, and, you know, everything seems to be going wrong. So anyway, I thought, well, I applied to income support for to get help to get some new items anyway they turned me down this was in uh, november october november is this, is this from the uh, the so-called yeah, anti-social so. front yeah fund yeah so anyway i went to see them again today and uh oh no um we cannot help you i says well out of 69 pounds we've got They've put central heating in, which we've got extra £5 a week to pay. We've got eight, uh, nearly £10 a week electric to pay. We've got our water, water rates and everything. Well, how can you afford to save to get a hoover or anything? Now, I mean, I'm asthmatical and I've got arthritis. My husband, well, I think he's going to be classed as disabled when he goes to, to Bath Avenue for his... Medical. Sorry, when it goes to bath in the nude, did you say? <laughs> I wish you was. Actually, Ian, did you did you say bath in the nude? No, Bath Avenue. Oh, sorry, oh, <laughs> sorry, Brenda. I could have sworn you no. said bath in the nude. No, you see, the thing is, How else you he's bath? only got the use of one arm. Right. Okay. So, so you you went to the uh, the income support, said, look, you know, everything's gone wrong. I need to replace this stuff, and they said, tough luck. Well, yeah, and what what is annoying me, I mean, you get people come over here, they can go there, they can get carpets, they can get furniture, they can get anything they want. But, just because, I mean, my husband worked six years, never lost one day, seven days a week he worked for this firm, and he's, he's just simply come out of work through falling 16 foot off top of a lorry. Well, I mean, he's 60 next birthday well i mean you know yourself as you get older older bones don't heal so quick and if what do you mean as i know myself i'm only 35 no what i mean older bones if you're young you yes. see, so you get over yeah, things quicker but 
when you're getting older, it takes longer. Now, I mean, I can't stand and hand wash because of my asthmatic and also because of arthritis I've got in my arm and my feet, uh, knees and feet. My husband is now waiting to go to the hospital uh, for x-rays on his knees and feet. He also does not see the consultant again until March. Now, what chance have we got out of £69 when we've got all this to pay out of being able to get these items again? And when, but, you, when you explain that to them, they just said, well, that's just hard luck. Yeah, yeah. And the thing, the, the thing that I am really annoyed over, Ian, is, I mean, you get these people that say, right, I've been working for so long, I've no intentions of getting a job. But uh, they could afford to save. Yes, but if they could afford to save. I mean, my husband was only on a low income before he had his accidents. And obviously, um, it has put us right. I mean, Christmas, we never had one single Christmas present between us. Uh, it's my birthday next Sunday. I shan't have a thing. Uh, I mean, it's created lots and lots of problems and when you go down to income support and you say to them well look I'm getting 16 pounds that's all I get off you that to make it up to a married couple's allowance of 69 pounds and they still expect you to keep your heating we're sitting here half the time froze because we didn't put the central heating on you wait till the um 17 and a half percent or whatever it is they've decided yeah. goes on yes Ian, but what's fair for one is fair for another isn't it i mean let's face it there's you know yourself there's people coming over from different countries they come over they get a house they get everything they want this is the first time I have been to them and ever asked for anything. I mean, it, I can't even go shopping. I can't buy stuff to put in the fridge. I can't wash. I've got heaps and heaps of washing and just can't do it. Because well, I, unfortunately, you see, Brenda, I've got to agree with you because I, I've only ever, I, I think I was on the Dole once for six months, but about ten years later, I got fired from a job. Yeah. And I went in, and the reason, I, I, it wasn't my fault I got fired. It was uh, the guy, they, they had no sense of humour. And yeah. I, I went in and I said, look, I've been fired and I've got no money. And I said, oh, well, sign on and we'll, we'll pay you some in three months. Yeah. So I thought, well, that's no good to me. What, what am I meant to do for three <laughs> months? So I disappeared off and I, I, I sorted myself out. I said, I got a job in radio and that's why I'm here. So yeah, thank you to the DSSSSS for that. Yeah. My dad got made redundant the week before Christmas. He went to sign, he, he's, he's never signed on in his life. No. You know, in, in, uh, ever since he's worked, since he was 15 years old, he's never signed on. He yeah. went down there and they said, Ah, oh, tough luck, come back in three months. What's well, going on? Yeah, well, this is what, this is my point. My husband worked seven days a week. For, uh, he worked overtime, he worked seven days a week on a low income, and then he comes out of work through an accident he had at work. And nobody's helping you? And uh, believe me, Ian, we are absolutely desperate for help but we cannot get it listen brenda i've got to move on i've got to move on but i accept your point and we'll throw the lines open see if anybody else is in the same situation with the dss but we hope things work themselves out for you right fill, it, you. fill in your pills coupon brenda poor i can't even afford to do that oh brenda brenda just 20p 30p Please, because if you come up, you'll remember your old friend Ian, won't you? Oh, yes. Oh, you're a very kind person. Yeah. Listen, Brenda, we've got to move, but we okay. hope things work out for okay, you. Okay, thanks. Ta-ra. There we go, that's Brenda. She says, husband, work, low pay, all his life. There he goes, has an accident. Goes down the DSS for money, for help. Doesn't get any. She can't hoover, because she hasn't got a hoover. Washing machine's packed up. Nobody is helping Brenda. Have you got a similar experience to that? 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. Now is a jolly good time to phone through, because, uh, well, uh, so it would be if we actually had any lines free, which we don't. But um, never mind, we'll just go through these lines and, uh, and answer them. So as we, we release the lines, obviously it's a very good time to, to phone through, because we'll answer them. And we'll put you on the midnight line. We talked about hypnosis, we talked about the DSSSSSS. Are they really doing the job? <laughs> Come on, Brenda, what? In the 60s, she goes down, she says, please help. And I said, no. Um, something's wrong somewhere, isn't it? 
We'll take some more calls, but first of all, ladies and gentlemen, may I play you this? May I play you this? What a fantastic commercial break it is. Brian Wordsworth of Tyne & Weir found new relief for his skin problem. I use Lanarkane medicated powder. I do tend to get rashes, perspiration, and itchy skin. And I found by using this powder, the itching disappears immediately. New triple action Lanarkane powder. Medicating action to stop itching. The drying action of zinc oxide. And absorbing action six times better than talc. Lanarkane medicated powder. I think it's marvellous. New triple action Lanarkane medicated powder. If symptoms persist, see your doctor. Hi, Mum. Are you ready yet? I'm in the kitchen. Come on, or we'll miss the... Oh, Mum, you've got Cresta blinds, and I thought you said they were... Terribly dusty. Actually, they're dust repellent. But didn't you say that... Can't be cleaned. Wrong again. These slats come off individually. But your curtains, Mum, you said oh, they... Oh, these are far more versatile than those old-fashioned things. So much more attractive. And they cost pounds less than new curtains would. And the colours. They match so well with this new... Water. Well, of course, I got redecorated first. Nothing could have matched that awful floral wallpaper. You might have told me, dear. Mum, I didn't tell you about Cresta Blinds. Remember? Cresta Blinds. Available direct from the factory in Dudley at a price you can afford. For more information, call Dudley 25523. Hold on a moment. Let them get a pen. Call Dudley 25523 for a colour brochure. In today's world, peace of mind can be difficult. With crime rates soaring, your home may be vulnerable to a thief's expensive tastes. Prevention is better than cure, and that's where Skyline Glazing Systems will help. The only window company in Telford to be approved by the Neighbourhood Watch, they have a range of high-quality windows and doors with a security locking system that helps to keep out unwanted visitors. You have to be more security conscious, which is why when you fit windows and doors, you should go to Skyline Glazing Systems, Horton Court, Hortonwood 50 in Telford. Call Telford, 677-470. The best music on the best station. Radio. Midnight Line on Beacon and WABC. It's a free-for-all, so you can talk about absolutely anything you want to talk about. 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. We got is that Bev? Is it? Hello. Yes, we'll stick you on first. Why not? Hello, Bev. Hello. Hello. Well, hello uh, to you. Hello. And lovely. <laughs> Happy New Year. And to you, Bev. <laughs> Halfway through. Only two weeks late, but there Only you go. Only two weeks late. Yes. Um, I, I'm in the same situation as the woman that was just on. Um, I'm 51. I've worked all my working life. I had an accident at work. Um, and they, they pay you, if you've worked 15 years or more, they pay you a little bit longer than the usual 28 weeks. Um, Sorry, 28 weeks for what? Sickness benefit? But that's right, yeah. yeah. And they're supposed to tell you when, you bent, when the, the money they pay you stops and they haven't. And I, I found Didn't out by notice, accident. Well, this is stop sending it. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I had to phone up about something and um, I found out simply by accident that my money has actually stopped. And I've got onto the DSS and filled in all the forms, and they just don't want to know. You know, I can't get anybody to give me any help at all. At the moment, I'm living on fresh air. It's healthy, got, though, uh, isn't it? I've got, <laughs> I've got a son at home. And, um, I mean, all I get is, oh, well, we'll, we'll back pay it. But it's no help to me now, and I'm getting no money at all. None at all. So by the time they sort it out, they say, well, we'll pay you whatever it is we owed you. Well, I shall be six foot under. I mean, I could do with losing weight, true, but... Uh, but not in this fashion. <laughs> it's a fashion. drastic way to do it. Yes, not eating. That's right, yes. The Princess Dye School of That's Slimming. Right. <laughs> At the moment, I, I've, well, I haven't paid my rent. I'm living on that. And then next week, it'll be the council tax money. I shall be living on that. And getting myself into debt as I go along. So what, what, what do they say when you phone them up? Um, well, you know, I've told them that, I mean, I literally, I haven't had any sleep for a week. Um, now, that's bad news for you, but it's good news for my ratings. Yeah, well, it is, actually. <laughs> you, you've got to look at it this I've got to way. do something. <laughs> yeah. So you're making somebody happy, Bev. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, so they, they really don't want to know. You know, I've told them I'm getting no money. I'm, I'm divorced. I haven't got another wage coming into this house. And all they, they just go, mm, and that's all you get out of them. 
That's it? That's it. Do you get the feeling that they don't really care about you? That yes. they're just going through the motions? Yes, I do. I really do. See, I got that. I mean, in my, my brief association, I'm pleased to say, with um, the DSSSSSS, I, was, um, was, I, I just got the impression they didn't give a smeg. No. So I thought, well, up yours, I don't want your money. That's right, I mean... But, but fortunately, I was in a position where I could do that. Well, well I wasn't really. I didn't have any money and I didn't <laughs> have a job, but I thought, <laughs> I thought, well, I better get myself sorted out. And luckily, or unluckily, whichever way you want to look at it, the gods were smiling benignly that night. Because I was working in radio about a week later. No, no. But, I mean, that ain't going to happen, really, to you, is it? I don't think they're smiling. No, they're not smiling oh. on me. I'm still waiting. I've been seeing an orthopaedic surgeon. Well, why don't you give the BBC a ring, ask them if they need any radio presenters? Because you know, you're better, you're better than the ones they've got. <laughs> At least you can, see, you, you can um, sort of, like, sling a sentence together, can't you? I think so, just about. There's yeah. more than I can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd just give them a call. Oh, well, I think I'd do that. I too. mean, if you, if, you yeah. could get, if you could get six family and friends to listen... Yeah. You've, got, you've got a programme. You'd yeah. double their audience. That's right. And they'd be very, very, very pleased about that. <laughs> oh, the ratings go up. <laughs> Morning, John. How are you, mate? Sorry, um, yeah, sorry, do go on. Um, <laughs> oh, I love being naughty. Yeah, you yeah. know, I was born to be naughty. I think I was, actually. Mischief maker, you know. Yeah, most, most, yeah. most definitely. Stir it with a great big paddle. Exactly, <laughs> yes. You can't beat it with a stick, can you? They said, <laughs> Not really. Mixing their metaphors with gay abandon. <laughs> So, the, the thing is, though, you, you've got no recourse, have you? There's not, not a lot you can do. Nothing. I mean, I, I suppose I could go up there and sit there and say, I'm not moving till you pay me some money, but um, in my state of health at the moment, I, don't, I can't sit for very long. So. But how's it, how has it come to this? It, it's come through, I mean, it, it's bad on, on the part of the firm I work for because apparently they should have sent me a letter two months ago, so all the forms that should have been could have been filled in on time, which they weren't. Um, although the, the DSS had all the forms before Christmas, um, they, I found them up last week and they kept me hanging on for 20 minutes in prime time. And all I got was, we haven't got your forms. And then 20 minutes later, they said, oh, we have, but we haven't had time to look at them. But they said, well, you know, we've got thousands of others, which, yes, yes well, they have. You're not very important. Go away. That's right, you know. And it, well, it, it, just, it just gets me so angry that, it, you know, oh, it's all right for us, we've got a job. Well, I'll tell you um, what, if, any, if anybody from the DSSSSSS are up late, and I don't see why they're not, because it doesn't seem to me they do much work during the day, um, if you want to defend yourself, then do give us a call. The lines are open for you to do that. 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. That's fair enough, isn't it, Beth? Fair enough, yes, if somebody can give me an answer. Why me? See, my, my, <laughs> my mum... <laughs> my mum is absolutely convinced that... Because, um, like I say, our family's only actually had two sort of run-ins, or not run-ins, but two times in... Oh, we've been lucky, you know, two times yes, in, the, in the past yes. 20 years where we, we've actually thought, oh, well, we'll go and sign on or something. And it's only happened twice in 20 years to any of us, so we're very, very lucky. And <laughs> each time we've gone, they said, sorry, you're not having anything. <laughs> and my mother is absolutely convinced that what you've got to do is um, be an illegal immigrant. Never thought of that. Be an illegal yeah. immigrant and go down there. And, and okay, this is, my mother honestly <laughs> believes this. But if you're an illegal immigrant and you go down there, they throw money across the counter at you. I, did you know? I think you're right. Yes, I shall have to cultivate a good accent and... Hello, I just arrived yesterday. I have no... Vi can we see your visa, I can't please? I English. Can I have... I, I, haven't, I haven't got one. I haven't got a visa. Oh, I'll have all this money in recompense. Yeah, I mean, it, it, as I say, it makes me so mad. I'm 51. I've worked all my working life and it's through circumstances. I mean, I hate doing it. I hate asking for it. Um, I mean, I've, I've had mention of uh, a work colleague who says that people that are on the DSS are scroungers, which I think I got really angry. Um, and I, I really don't want to do it. I'd rather be at work, but I've been told I cannot work. A unit for the moment. I don't know whether, you know, later on perhaps the, the surgeon will say, yes, you can, but at the moment he says, no, I can't. Listen, Beth, we've got to move on. Okay. But we thank you for uh, for chiming in with that one. They've got a lot to answer for by the sounds of it. I think they have. So yes. let's have some answers from the DSSSSSS. Why do you keep people who obviously need help? Why don't you give them help? I mean, we're meant to we're meant to have a welfare state, aren't we? Supposedly, I don't know where. I think it's uh, fast disappearing. 
self-satisfied Thatcher. <laughs> Okie dokie, Beb. Okay. Speak to you soon. Bye. To, oh, by the way. Yes. Yes, uh, Eric, so can you phone him or something? I'm... Pardon? <laughs> Eric, I, I answered Eric's call. Eric called in, you see, while, while I was talking to you. Yeah. And he said, tell her to phone me. Oh, well, I haven't got his number. Well, I'll sort that out for okay. you. Okay. All right. Okay. Ta-ra. Bye. So you do a multitude of tasks. Who's next? we got Bob. Morning, Bob. Morning. Good morning to you. <laughs> and the same to yourself. Uh, that's a Belfast accent, is it? Yeah. Ah, you see. You see. Tune the ear into the Irish accent, I have. And generally tell within about sort of 30 miles where one's from. <laughs> what a useless skill to have, eh? <laughs> of all the things I could have learned to do. Well, it's not a useless skill of... Uh been able to detect accents myself over the years for different parts of the country so that when I meet people when I used to go abroad on holiday or I used to be able to say, Oh, you're from the Midlands or you're from the south of England and The best one I ever did like was, I told this girl when I was at university I met this uh, this girl came to live in our halls of residence and uh, I took I listened to her accent, said you're from Sunderland and the number of times she'd been accused of being a Geordie that she, to actually identify that she's really from Sunderland went down jolly jolly well that did. <laughs> And I suppose it's quite useful if you're walking down the Fool's Road late at night, you know, to be able to sort of uh, detect which um, which, which accent. part of the bell bell exactly, from. Yes, yeah. The thing is, in some cases, you're going to have to uh, be accurate to 20 yards, aren't you? You do, and, uh, indeed. The only problem is the Falls Road and the Shangle Road accents are almost exactly the same. You move out of those two areas, it happens to soften a wee bit. Right, I'll bear that in mind next time. I'm. Uh, <laughs> What's that guy walking down the Falls Road? Bloke, uh, bloke comes in a car, sticks a gun out the window, and says, uh, "What religion are you?" The guy he thinks quickly. He says, uh, "He says I'm Jewish." The reply comes Catholic back, I, "I must be the luckiest Arab in Belfast." <laughs> <laughs> the old ones are the best. Anyway, what can we do for you, Bob? Uh, unemployment. Yes. Now, as someone who has been out of work from July. Uh, I've been going for an average of uh, one job per fortnight only to be told in uh, all of them that I'm too old. How old are you, Bob? 43. And you're too old at 43? What, what line of work are you in? I'm um, an upholsterer. Uh, I used to cover sweets, do antiques and things like that. But most of the upholstery firms in this area are uh, all mass production work. And as such, at my age, I'm too slow for them. It's not quality they want, it's more quantity. Therefore, they're not interested. I'd like to see whether the... I mean, I, I would accept that um, a 15-year-old probably has faster reactions than a 70-year-old, but not in all cases. Well, uh, but where, where's the evidence that you're too old at 43? Well, you see, the, the problem with it is that nowadays, in 90% of the upholstery companies in the area, most of them are mass production work, and it's what is called track work whereby somebody puts an arm on, somebody else puts it back on, somebody else does the seat. So it's like one giant production line. Therefore, you have to have a speed. And as most of the people on these lanes are normally in their early 20s, uh, they'll be a lot faster. I'm more used to being lifting a frame and covering the whole thing. Whereas most of the people that are trained at the trade nowadays, if you ask them to cover the whole thing, they wouldn't know what to do because they're not used to doing the whole thing on their own. They're not used to working from bare frame up. And as such, they've got to the state whereby uh, if somebody has been putting the foam on for them, then they come along, put a wee bit of cover on, somebody else puts another bit of cover on, so it's just one big production line. Quantity and, instead of quality? Well, at the cheaper end of the market, where unfortunately a lot of the major companies in this area happen to retail the lower to the middle end of the market it is quantity that counts quality can come but uh, they're not looking for uh, they're not looking for the sort of quality that I would be looking at when I would be doing antiques or something like that has anybody actually said to your face look you're too old for this uh, the, what they've actually said is that we don't think he would be fast enough what are they looking for Linford Christie <laughs> Probably, more than likely, someone of someone that is fast. What they expect, you see, is uh, the sort of speeds they're working at. Uh, you more or less have to be able to run round the bench all day. 
Well, it's, it, it's one of the problems that I think we, we sort of got around to talking about last night, was that if you have 2.76 million people, and that's the official number of people on the rock and roll, yeah, that's a massive social weapon, isn't it? I mean, you can pick and choose. You can be ruthless. True. I mean, you could, you could decide that you only wanted people with blonde hair. True. And uh, out of all the um, discriminations that go on within society, and, and there's heaps of them, the, the one thing that there's no legislation against is discrimination against age. Uh, yeah, but there is uh, in America, because I, I have friends uh, who uh, live in America, and it is actually against the law in America to discriminate on age. Should that be the case here? Uh, I can see no... The, the problem is uh, they don't actually say you're discriminating on age. They, they say, as in my case, they're discriminating because you're not fast enough. And technically, really, the reason you're not fast enough is because you haven't got the legs that you did have when you started at the trade. But it's a terrible thing to think, isn't it? That, you know, you get to 35 and that's it. I mean, what's, what's going on? I mean, there are certain societies um, in the world that actually value old, the old. The older you are, the, the more venerated you are. Yeah. Well, wh wh why is that so different here? Uh, because they don't... In this country, they don't realise the skill. Because they've taken over the 80s, uh, when you had a sort of mentality, grab, 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 and the skills that were in place then gradually became lost as everything became more automated and uh, the wisdom and skill that came that you learnt with age uh, just gradually faded out. But it's interesting, isn't it, the, the, the way that we have dealt with automation. Yeah. Uh, if you look at Karl Marx, well, you'd have to go down Highgate Cemetery if you want to look at Karl <laughs> Marx, but I mean, if you look at what he wrote, then he, he, he actually said that as society progressed, and as automation took over, uh, the way he viewed it, very naively as it turns out, is that the big problem everyone's going to have is what to do with your leisure time. But instead, what we've done is we've taken automation and yeah. we've just grabbed it to use more profit and more greed. And who cares about those people over there exactly. as long as I'm making some money? That, that has been the problem over the years. And not only that, with the skills being lost, especially in the lake of my trade, now... In most of my trade nowadays, uh, you will train someone to do the job within a couple of months. Whereas when I was now started at the trade, I had to serve an apprenticeship of five years, which meant that I learned everything about the trade. I learned how to do things by hand and everything else. I learned how to cut my own covers and everything. But kids nowadays don't learn this. And the problem is that by the time they get to their mid-30s, uh, they'll be too old. They'll be out of work, and they'll have nothing that they can even pass on, or maybe go into another part of the trade if it becomes available. They'll not be able to go into, perhaps, companies that specialise in the leg of antiques and things like this. They'll not be able to go into that area of the trade because they have no skill. See, so it's become, it has become, to a certain degree, uh, more a labourer's job than a skilled job. Because they, they, it doesn't seem that people serve apprenticeships anymore. No. And to a certain degree, it is, it is the fault of the 80s, to a degree again, whereby people were taught that when they went to work, they were going to get good wages. When you started an apprenticeship, uh, you were paid rubbish. No, I mean, you were more or less a fetch and carry until you maybe got into your second year, then started learning something. And it wasn't really until you got into maybe a fifth year of your apprenticeship, you started to earn any decent money. But, but then the, the problem nowadays is that the kids want decent money from the very start. And they've been led by government and their peers to believe that that's what they should expect. They shouldn't have to be training for a job. There shouldn't be apprenticeships because it's no longer necessary. But the advantage, I suppose, of, of apprenticeships, yeah, OK, it's tough when, you, <clears throat> when you, you're doing your first couple of years, but you learn the job properly, and as exactly. you say, you, you get a skill. I, mean, I, I, think, I think I served an apprenticeship, not, not a, um, an official one. But, in fact, I've served two. I served one in advertising and one in radio. Yeah. And I honestly believe that if you want to be good at your job, Go back.
homophobic call. There's not very many pro-gay ones for some reason, but... Well, that, that was another reason for not doing it. I thought, do I really want to sit here and talk to homophobes for two <laughs> hours? And came to the conclusion, nah, too hard. When you've heard one person phone you up and say, it's unnatural, you've heard them all. <laughs> I mean, you just give up. I mean, you either... You either accept it or you don't, you know. There's, 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 I, don't, I don't think that a radio show could convince anybody e either way. I mean, if somebody's a homophobe, they're a homophobe, and uh, it, it's going to take more than me to talk him out of it. Because I always reckon that homophobes are actually gay. It's just they don't want to admit it. Yeah, there's quite a few theories on that line. I think we will find, yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm absolutely sure that in a lot of cases it's repressed homosexuality. Yeah, um, I mean, I know that from my experiences in the past that... Um, I have actually written to you before and discussed it that um, the people that I had trouble with at school about queer bashing things were the ones who asked for um, sexual favours in return at later dates. So well, we used, to, we used to have, um, I, I'll be honest with you, we used to have a guy, we used to call him the class puff, right? Uh -huh. And the reason he was a class puff was because he, he, he was a gentle guy. That was it, that was all. And we made his life a misery. I mean, I'm ashamed of it now. But we made his life a misery because he was a gentle guy. And we were all like, you know, scrapping and chucking bricks at each other's heads and that sort of thing. And we made his life a misery and he was a puff, cause he, not because he was effeminate or anything like that, but because he was gentle. And we interpreted that when we were 14, 15 as, as being somehow sort of um, girly. And now I realise, looking back, that what we were actually scared of, and it was we were scared that we were gay. And because at 14, 15 you don't know. And it goes through your head that you might be. Well, I think that at 14 or 15, most people who are, are sort of work it out themselves. Ah, but that's the problem if you're not, you see. <laughs> 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 but I honestly think it, it came out all that lot, and we made that poor lad's life a misery. Um, I like to be first, and we did sort of take it quite well. Um, I, Do you have any choice in the matter here? <laughs> not really, no. <laughs> well, if he, would, if he would volunteer to be librarian, what do you, what do you expect? <laughs> um, and I, I'm absolutely scared that that was because we... I'm absolutely convinced that was because we were scared, because we didn't know, you know, you don't know anything about homosexuality. You just, uh, uh, if you're heterosexual, mm -hmm. then I think you just spend your life hoping to God you're not secretly a homosexual, you know, when you're 14 or 15. But, um, because I, I, I mean, I'm totally honest about it. I, I went through a phase once where I thought, God, I, I, what if I'm gay? And I came to the conclusion, I mean, this is stupid, it took me about three weeks to come to this conclusion. But the conclusion I came to was I couldn't possibly be gay because I didn't fancy blokes. <laughs> <laughs> and I fancied women. Well, at the moment, I'm a criminal, so cause I'm under 21 at the moment. You're going to jail, you are. Oh, I'm sure they'll lock me up and throw away the key if they want to. But... Great idea, eh? You, you get under, uh, what, what are they going to do with people who are underage homosexuals? Send them into a place where there's just men. Brilliant! Yeah, what a, um, great, what yeah, a great bit of thinking. Leave us totally open to being mass raped and beaten up. You know, brilliant <laughs> idea. How old are you? At the moment, I'm 20, but I've known I was gay since I was 13. Um... And I've been very happy with my sexuality since I was about 14, 15. See, I, I believe that to be the bottom line. The bottom line is, are you happy with your sexuality? And if you are, where's the problem? Well, this is it. I mean, I'm happy being a heterosexual. I mean, at the end of the day, if people have got a problem with it, then that, that's their problem and not mine. I've got to live my life, and I don't see why a few people's small-mindedness and lack of education should result in me having to suffer. I mean... Are you... Do, do you feel that... Um, homosexuals are more accepted now? Um, I do, yeah. I mean, I have not had very many problems with it at all. I've had, like, since I left school, I think I've had two incidents of trouble. One was just, like, name-calling. The other one was beating up in the middle of the street on the way home from a nightclub for it. But well, because you were gay? Yeah. And the funny thing is that one of the people who beat me up happened to have been in the gay nightclub, <laughs> which is a bit... Um, suspect really, but... Just a little. But, um, what we campaign for at the moment is equality on the age of consent. Um, there's lots of talks that they want to lower the age of consent to 18, which, to me, doesn't do anything at all. It's still discriminatory. Well, the heterosexual age of consent is 16, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, on that basis, I should have been locked up. <laughs> um, and the, the current, uh, of all people, Edwina Curry was speaking out about it, yeah. but it's currently the homosexual age of consent, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 21, isn't it? it? Is, yeah. And there are two options, to reduce it to 16, to put it on a parity with heterosexual, mm -hmm. heterosexuals, or the cop-out, which is 18. Yeah, I mean... Uh, and I, I think it's going to be the cop-out. Um, well, I was in Parliament last night, 
Oh, hey. Oh, I was, yeah. <laughs> there was a bit of a rally with one of the gay quality groups, Stonewall. Um, we had quite a few notable people there, like Serena McKellen and MPs like Edwina Curry popping in now, and Chris Smith MP, as well as rock group Suede, and if they are a rock group. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll, we'll call them a rock group. We'll call them a rock group. And Stephen Fry, and apparently it's a lot closer than um, what papers like The Sun are saying. The Sun reckon it's somewhere like only one in five MPs who went for 16. Whereas the latest survey shows it's more like 51, 49. But if, you, if you're onto an example of homophobia in print, then look no further than the sun. I mean, just looking at it now, page, well, they've just got a problem with sex. You know, they've got a problem that people do it. I mean, page three on the sun today. Oh, yeah, are they all there, so. <laughs> you don't get many of them to the pound, do you? Um, I wouldn't know about that, Ian. <laughs> just, to, just to the left, it says, Phil, I'm coronation straight. He and TV's Gary deny gays gossip. Well, you know, who cares, really? Well, we and then newspapers you take you take it over your performance in the witness box was like calf Beale's tv rape scene what qc told actress and it, it's it's all about whether or not she had oral sex in a land rover or yeah. a range rover yeah. who cares why um, is that important people are dying for god's sake around the globe and we're oh well we, 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 we're terribly british we've got this problem about sex People do sex, everybody. Hey, it's official. I don't exclusively reveal that as we speak, somebody's probably doing it now. Now, I think we ought to find them and stop them because it's a disgusting thing to do. How can people make love to each other? That is that is just not the British way of doing things. Well, we'll leave that to Harry Hun across the channel. Well, of course, I'm not allowed to do that, am I, Ian? Because 20 years old, I'm only old to vote and die for my country, but... Listen, if it's any consolation, heterosexuals aren't allowed to do it, unless it's filmed <laughs> behind closed doors, um, with closed curtains, under the covers, with the lights off. I can't believe our attitude to sex. It's pathetic. Well, I think the, the country as a whole is so far in the dark ages that... It may as well be locked away and forgotten. Well, I heard some guy the other day, and they're going, oh, oh that was just some law and order debate, some kick the government's got on at the moment. And they were um, they were going on about how they're going to clamp down on pornography. Why? Why don't you just get off, Smeghead? I mean, half of them, I, I just don't believe how hypocritical this lot are. Yeah? Yeah. They're, they're, they're the same, right, OK, first of all, no gays. All right, that's official from the government. No gays. None of these woofters. Number two. No sex. Number three, certainly no photographing it or videoing it. Oh, no. And then where do they go? Madam Whippy's knocking emporium. Or they go off and they sire uh, an illegitimate child. Oh, what a bunch of hypocrites. Don't preach your phony morality at me, Westminster, and get that one down, GCHQ. It's pretty radical. <laughs> well, it is something else pretty radical for you, which I think is rather good. Um, a direct quote from Stephen Fry, who was one of the guest speakers that this rally I went to last night, Parliament. Um, he was answering questions on um, wouldn't an age consent to 16 leave 16 year olds open to being preyed on, so to speak, by middle aged men in dirty or great raincoats? Yeah, most of them are probably members of parliament. <laughs> well, his answer was well, is the actual sexual age consent a charter for middle aged men to hang around the netball court? And what's wrong with that? <laughs> it's a perfectly fine occupation. <laughs> But at the end of the day, I mean, it boils down to, well, hang on, what goes on in the straight community? I mean, it's no different to the way gay people work. I mean, if we're talking questions of morals, the heterosexual community's got abortion and divorce and... Um, we're not going to have either of those adultery. under the current, um, uh, current scheme of things, not unless medical science <laughs> takes massive leaps forward. I, see, no, I, mean, I, think, I honestly think that people are frightened. I don't know what they're frightened of, but I've been there myself. I mean, I, I used to be really frightened of gays because I thought they were going to put the hand on me knee and that sort of thing. Um, when I was working, I used to work on the agricultural shows and um, used to get digs. Mm -hmm. And one night, I, I, I don't know how it happened, but I mean, I, I was sleeping with both eyes open because I was sharing the room with a gay bloke. And I was thinking, you know, if he comes anywhere near me, he's leaving by that window over there, no problem. Uh, at the end of it, he's one of the kindest, nicest people I've ever met. It, it's, it's just a heterosexual myth yeah, I mean, that, that homosexuals want to get in your pants. It's a load of rubbish. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, most gay people are the most polite people that you can meet because they don't inflict themselves on you, not in a sort of like sexual nature anyway. I mean, the behaviour might sort of get a flamboyant in there, but oh yeah, but I mean, I have the, I have the Mickey taken out. I mean, I, I I've got quite a lot of gay friends, and if I turn up wearing my motorcycle leathers, they look at me and say, "Oh, nice." 
and that sort of thing. And just take the mickey for I mean, I, I'm, I am easy in... No, I don't know what I mean. I, I'm comfortable in, the pre, in, in uh, gay people's company. I'm totally and utterly comfortable. Never meet a friendly lot of people anyway. Sorry? Never meet a friendly a lot of people. For sure. In fact, a mate of mine, uh, we were talking about him earlier in the show. In fact, I think I want paying for this. We've talked about him <laughs> so much. But we, um, he's, he's a, uh, a hypnotist. And I was saying, you want to do a gay club? I bet that would be hilarious. <laughs> um, I think some of the um, gay people that would be hilarious, actually. Anyway. Exactly. Well, you see, the, the thing that makes a stage hypnotist act are the, are, are the subjects, are the people that you get on stage. And I thought, oh, get yourself down, get a few drama queens, literally drama queens, get them on stage, no problem. <laughs> I think they'd laugh it up, to be quite honest. <laughs> do, you, do you think that, that, that society is, is sort of becoming more tolerant? I do, and at the same time I think that society ought to mind its own business and let people live their lives instead of persecuting them and being hypocritical, telling them what they can and can't do, especially when they preach about things they know nothing about. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you see, I, I believe that for, for a government to even think about legislation about your sex life is about as valid as, as, as me thinking about introducing legislation for religion. Yeah. You know, so, well, hopefully so, we decided to ban your Catholicism for you. Why? Why should I do that? If people want to do it, that's up to them. It's the personal freedom. I am sick and flipping tired of other people attempting to tell me and everyone else what to do and how to think. It really drives me balmy. I yeah. hate it. Because they've got no mandate to do that. What they're saying is, look at me, I'm great, me. I'm great and I live my life in a great fashion and you've got to do the same. Get lost. At the end of the day, the government's job is to run the country. And, and they're not doing that very no, well. I'd love to know when they're going to start, to be quite honest. <laughs> yes, give us a shout, we'd all like to know. <laughs> but one thing I'd also like to know is why it took a Conservative MP to propose the amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill to equal age consent after Labour and Liberal have milked gay votes for quite a few years on the promise of a few gay rights. It's cool not putting your head above the parapet. Um, it's like I totally and utterly believe that pornography, not child pornography, uh -huh. um, or animals or stuff like that, but your run of the mill pornography, there's a, there's a lot of myths about that. First of all, that it's violent. I have never seen, I, when I was in Amsterdam, obviously, um, I've never seen a violent porn movie. I've, see, I've seen, uh, I, I've gone to the cinema and watched movies that are far more violent than pornography. And yet you've got these people uh, and they won't stick their head up. They won't, they won't say, well, why don't we legalise it? Because if they do, the sun's going to say, pervert. Well, does anybody actually believe the sun anyway? And if they do, they'll be in dangerous ground, I think, aren't well, you? If you believe it, you're in serious, serious trouble. Listen, I've got to move on, Adrian. Yep. Okay. Um, but uh, when is the boat? Um, well, the actual date will be sometime the week after next. Okay, well, we'll look out for that then. Holding that frequency, Ian. Okay, dokie, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Ta-ra. Okay, ta -ra. There we go, Adrian. He's gay. He doesn't care. He knows it. And why, why should he care? Who's, bet uh, who's Petrina? This is Petrina. Good morning. Good How morning. Are you? I've never heard of anything like this government. Uh, They're hopeless, aren't they? What a load they? of rubbish. They're on the sly as well with what was Eric was on about. Westminster flats being sold for uh, promises of votes. Disgusting state of affairs, isn't it? I just don't understand what right anybody has to preach morals to me. I mean, I don't preach them to anybody else, so why should they preach them to me? No, I, I can't understand why that it's taken so long for them to bring this through anyway, and I hope that they vote correctly, that uh, they shouldn't uh, discriminate against them, because if two lesbian girls can, can get together at 16, why can't uh, the male uh, gay population do the same? I, I think they're discriminating unfairly. Ah, oh, well, I mean, that, that is the, the, the ultimate in heterosexual hypocrisy, isn't it? Yeah. It's well, it's you sit there, you know, all the lads together, I put the bluey on, it's got two women together in it. Whoa. Yeah. What? <laughs> Blokes? Together? Puffs? Yeah, they won't oh, it's, it's so hypocritical. Anyway, what I was ringing about uh, was uh, Bev and the, the lady before. I've got two phone numbers for them if they'd like to grab a paper and pen. So, if you grab a paper and pen, we'll give you those numbers again at the end of the phone call. <laughs> my telephonist voice again. It's a very good telephonist voice, isn't Actually, it? Actually, I don't feel very well today. You don't sound very well, Petrina. We're all very worried about this. <laughs> well, I'm going to try um, Eric's remedy for stomach ulcer. What was it? Sherry and an egg, wasn't it? Or something? For a stomach ulcer? Yeah. Is that what you've got? Yeah, it's ulcerated stomach. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope it doesn't burst or anything nasty. Hey, if it does burst... If yeah, it does burst, look on the bright side for me, yeah, not you. Yeah, you know, but if it does, if it... Um, if it does, would you mind being on the phone to me when it happens? Because it'd be great radio. 
<laughs> I've often thought, you know, all these, sadistic all these people, all these people selfishly dying. <laughs> we asked them as a thought for the midnight line and the ratings it could get if they came and did it live. Oh, good, between the snuffs, they'll be glad to hear the end of me on the show. Let's look at it this way, Katrina. <laughs> Bad news for you, great news for my ratings. <laughs> so you can't go all through your life being selfish, young lady. <laughs> One thing I, that I'm not, and that's selfish. Oh, these people popping the clogs. You've only got to look in the paper. Did they phone me just before they went? No, they didn't. No. <laughs> what were they thinking of? Anyway, back to these phone numbers so oh, you get right, back sorry. to others. Uh, the DSS advice line is 0800 66 65 55. 66 Yeah. Or indeed, triple six, triple five. Well, thanks. <laughs> That's okay, it's just a different way of putting it, That's all. <laughs> and the Department of Health, which uh, handle questions as well, and they send all the forms out and give you the right information. And that is another free phone line, that is 0800 66 55 44. Uh, I find that uh, these are a better help to you than uh, go and see somebody at your local DHS office uh, because they seem to have more information available to them than the person that's at the desk that's a bit mithered and don't always give the correct information. The lady regards to having a, a social fund, I think that she should be entitled to it, particularly to repair a washing machine. So they will give the correct information out and well, I just wanted to give you a How about that? Just wanted you're to give these things out. You're a kind and caring person. Well, they helped me out. They sorted out my insurance claim and, and me invalidity benefit, etc., etc. So uh, hopefully they will help both ladies and uh, anybody else that needs help like that. And they don't cost them anything. And uh, as I say, they've got all the information there and they'll send the forms out to you, the, the relevant ones you want for your particular claims. Well, that's lovely. Okay, You're a very lovely. kind person. I, I am. I'm lovely. I'm, I'm, just being I'm also poorly today. Oh, well, we all hope <laughs> you feel better. I, I just uh, thought it just crossed my mind. We had um, a shareholders meeting at Beacon and WABC Towers today. Yeah. Well, I'm not one of them. No, no, but I am. <laughs> so we um, we went to the um, we went to the meeting light, and um, we, uh, I mean it's common knowledge, you know, we, we've had a cash injection, and we've joined uh, a much larger group. Well, uh, you said that a few weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 whichever way you look at it, it's good news for the company. But um, it isn't going to change your actual programs, is it? Well, no. Well, at least it wasn't. <laughs> Well, after the meeting. Well, no, I met the, uh, they, they introduced me to the uh, deputy chairman of the entire shebang. And I was just thinking, I was talking, oh yeah, we do a phone show. He said, well, you know, we don't, we don't really do phone shows in the, the rest of the group. And I said, well, you know, I mean, the thing is, it's 65% uh, audience, uh, you know, it's a winner. What I was angling after, between you and me, and the other 30 million people listening, was I was after getting the whole thing networked, you see, yeah. across the group. I think that'd be a really good idea. And uh, I was after that, like, so, you know, giving him the... I said, yeah, you know, if you're in the area tonight, you want to listen? I think, oh, man, what if you just listen to that? Why don't dead people phone me up? <laughs> oh, God. Yes, you can have this sort of sick conversation. Just blasting. think, if, you, if you've got this televised, they'd all be listening to me kicking the bucket, wouldn't they? <laughs> Well, I think somebody somebody needs to take the plunge and do it sometime. I think it's only fair. It doesn't matter how bad uh, things are. There's always uh, some bright. All that. Come on. It won't come at all. It's midnight line. <laughs> Katie on Perry. <laughs> Good morning, Eric. And how are you? Good morning, Eric. Give him your oh, answer. Give him your question. That's close. And he will give it to you. So to speak. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Eric. What an absolutely fine variation on a catchphrase that is. Huh? Do you want to, do you want to turn your wireless down? Oh. There you go, you turn your wireless down. If you can turn your wireless down, then uh, you better hear what I'm saying. There you go. So I've already heard that bit. Well, the moment now, this is out. Good morning, Eric. What a fine variation on a catchphrase that was. What a good one, isn't it? Yeah, crack of that. Like that. No, that's good, that is. That is good, Eric. Yeah. Uh, just one kind of thought. Midnight line. Give your questions to Ian Perry, and he will answer them for you, like Wall's ice cream. <laughs> that's very good.
Chris Lowe, you're going to be very impressed with that. Um, you know, what yes. was I going to say to well, you? Well, um, hold on. Who's got the red car? I don't know. That radio has turned itself up mysteriously. Hey? No, never mind. Um, I, I don't know. What were you going to say to us, Eric? Oh, uh... Did you see where, um... The Tories sold the houses? Ah, this would be Westminster Council, would it? Yeah. Huh. What do you reckon of that? Oh, uh, oh, goal. Yeah. Um, your programme last night was a bit on the rocky side as well, wasn't it? What? You mean we played some... Um, I mean, young chaps saying they didn't want to work. Well, you can... I've often thought that the work ethic is overrated. I think work today is a dirty word. Yeah, I'd go with that. Yeah. I'm a workaholic. Mention it, I go out and get drunk. Yeah. No, um... When I said, like, give, tell Bab to give me a ring... Yeah. I'd probably give her some information that would help her. Okie dokie. And, uh... That's a soft question to ask you where she lives. Um, Birmingham Way. Yeah, Birmingham Way. In fact, let's have a look at the code. Uh, um, the captain I want to know about. Yes, you want to know about the captain? Ask me any question you like about the captain. I will answer it in seconds. Yeah. Is he, is he ill or something? Yes, he's got a very bad dose. Oh, because I missed I it the on the night as he gave it out. Yeah, very, very sick, very poorly, and he has got to go to bed early, and he's uh, he's got the flu. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Shocking business, but there you go. Yeah. But thank you for inquiring about his health. Yeah. The pensioners are looking after him for a change. The pensioners are? Yes. Oh, that's good. That's good. They give him a good massage and rub it out, he'll be all right. Absolutely, that's what you need, isn't it? Yes. Anyway, Ian. Yes, Eric? I forgot what I was going to <laughs> ask you tonight, but it's Well, gone. never mind, because the catchphrase made it all worthwhile. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, Eric. All the best. Sir. All the best. There you go, get to remember it eventually, I would imagine. Adrian, good morning. Good morning, Ian. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing very well. What can we do for you? Um, I'm talking about the guy you can send to him. The yeah, age of consent. Now, I was thinking about doing this as a, um, as a subject this um, week. Very good idea, to Ian. <laughs> but I decided on the on the I decided not to, and the reason I decided not to was because there's, as far as I can see, there's only one. I mean, I, I have to be able to argue each corner, yeah. Mhm. Mm and I I honestly couldn't argue against it because I don't see that a government has any right to legislate what you do in bed. I'm very pleased to hear you say that as well, I mean, what are they going to do? Stick a policeman on the next bed? <laughs> yeah, excuse me, lady. Can I, uh, can I see your birth certificate, lad? <laughs> so I came to the conclusion that as a phone show, it'd be a bit one-sided. Yeah, I know that in the past when you've had um, phone shows on the issue, um, well, and the sexuality generally, that you've had quite a few homophobic callers, not very many pro-gay ones for some reason, but... Well, that, that was another reason for not doing it. I thought, do I really want to sit here and talk to homophobes for two <laughs> hours and came to the conclusion, nah, it's too hard. When you've heard one person phone you up and say, it's unnatural, you've heard them all, <laughs> I mean, you just give up. I mean, you either, you either accept it or you don't, you know. There's, 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 I, don't, I don't think that a radio show could convince anybody either way. I mean, if somebody's a homophobe, they're a homophobe, and uh, it's going to take more than me to talk him out of it, because I always reckon that homophobes are actually gay. It's just they don't want to admit it. Yeah, there's quite a few theories on that line. I think we will find, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm absolutely sure that in a lot of cases it's repressed homosexuality. Yeah, um, I mean, I know that from my experiences in the past that um, I have actually written to you before and discussed it, that um, the people that I had trouble with at school about queer bashing things were the ones who asked um, sexual favours in return at later dates. Um, well, we used, to, we used to have, um, I, I'll be honest with you, we used to have a guy, we used to call him the class puff, right? Uh -huh. And the reason he was a class puff was because he, he he was a gentle guy. That was it, that was all. And we made his life a misery. I mean, I'm ashamed of it now. But we made his life a misery because he was a gentle guy. And we were all like, you know, scrapping and chucking bricks at each other's heads and that sort of thing. And we made his life a misery and he was a puff, cause he, not because he was effeminate or anything like that, but because he was gentle. And we interpreted that when we were 14, 15. As, as being somehow sort of um, 
girly. And now I realise, looking back, that what we were actually scared of, and it was we were scared that we were gay. And because at 14, 15, you don't know. And it goes through your head that you might be. Well, I think that at 14 or 15, most people who are have sort of worked it out themselves. Ah, but that's the problem if you're not, you see. <laughs> 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 but I honestly think it came out of all that lot, and we made that poor lad's life a misery. Um, no, though, to be fair to me, we did sort of take it quite well. Um, I, Do you have any choice in the matter here? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he would, if he would volunteer to be librarian, what do you, what do you expect? <laughs> um, and I, I'm absolutely scared that that was because we. I'm absolutely convinced that was because we were scared because we didn't know. You know, you don't know anything about homosexuality. You just uh, uh, if you're heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Dan, I think you just spend your life hoping to God you're not secretly a homosexual, you know, when you're 14 or 15. But, um, because I, I, I mean, I'm totally honest about it. I, I went through a phase once where I thought, God, I, I, what if I'm gay? And I came to the conclusion, I mean, this is stupid, it took me about three weeks to come to this conclusion. But the conclusion I came to was I couldn't possibly be gay because I didn't fancy blokes. <laughs> and I fancied women. Well, at the moment, I'm a criminal, so I'm under 21 at the moment. You're going to jail, you are. Oh, I'm sure they'll lock me up and throw away the keys if they want to. But... Great idea, eh? You, you get under age... What, what are they going to do with people who are underage homosexuals? Send them into a place where there's just men. Brilliant! Yeah. What a great, um, what yeah, a great bit of thinking. Leave us totally open to being mass raped and beaten up. You know, brilliant <laughs> idea. How old are you? At the moment, I'm 20, but I've known I was gay since I was 13. Um, and I've been very happy with my sexuality since I was about... 14, 15. See, I, I believe that to be the bottom line. The bottom line is, are you happy with your sexuality? And if you are, where's the problem? Well, this is it. I mean, I'm happy being a heterosexual. I mean, at the end of the day, if people have got a problem with it, and that, that's their problem and not mine, I've got to live my life. And I don't see why a few people's small-mindedness and lack of education should result in me having to suffer. I mean... Are you... Do, do you feel that um, homosexuals are more accepted now? Um, I do, yeah. I mean, I have not had a very many problems with it at all. I've had, like, since I left school, I think I've had two incidents of trouble. One was just, like, name-calling. The other one was beaten up in the middle of the street on the way home from a nightclub for it, but... Well, because you were gay? Yeah. And the funny thing is that one of the people who beat me up happened to have been in the gay nightclub, <laughs> which is a bit um, suspect, really, isn't it? Just a little. But um, what we campaign for at the moment is equality on the age of consent. Um, there's lots of talks that they want to lower the age of consent to 18, which to me doesn't do anything at all. It's still discriminatory. Well, the heterosexual age of consent is 16, isn't yeah. it? I mean, on that basis, I should have been locked up. <laughs> um, and the, the current, uh, of all people, Edwina Curry was speaking out about it, yeah. but it's currently the homosexual age of consent, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 21, isn't it? Is, it? Yeah. And there are two options, to reduce it to 16, to put it on a parity with heterosexual, mm -hmm. heterosexuals, or the cop-out, which is 18. Yeah, I mean... Uh, and I, I think it's going to be the cop-out. Um, well, I was in Parliament last night. Oh, hey! I was, yes. <laughs> there was a bit of a rally with one of the gay quality groups, Stonewall, and um, we had quite a few notable people there, like Serena McKellen and MPs like Edwina Curry popping in now, and um, Chris Smith MP, as well as rock group Suede, and if they are a rock group... <laughs> well, yeah, we'll call them a rock group. We'll call them something online. And Stephen Fry, and apparently it's a lot closer than um, what papers like The Sun are saying. The Sun reckon it's somewhere like only one in five MPs are going to 16. Whereas the latest survey shows it's more like 51, 49. But if you, if you want an example of homophobia in print, then look no further than the sun. I mean, just looking at it now, page... Oh, they've just got a problem with sex. You know, they've got a problem that people do it. I mean, page three on the sun today... <laughs> you don't get many of them to the pound, do you? Um, I wouldn't know about that, Ian. <laughs> just, to, just to the left, it says, Phil, I'm coronation straight. He and TV's Gary deny gays gossip. Well, you know, who cares, really? Well, and then the newspapers just after. You take, you take it over, your performance in the witness box was like Kath Beale's TV rape scene, what QC told actress. And it, it's, it's all about whether or not she had oral sex in the Land Rover or yeah. a Range Rover. Who cares? Why is that important? People are dying, for God's sake, around the globe. And we're, oh, well, we, 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 we're terribly British. We've got this problem about sex. People.
people do sex, everybody. Hey, it's official, and I'm exclusively reveal that as we speak, somebody's probably doing it now. Now, I think we ought to find them and stop them, because it's a disgusting thing to do. How can people make love to each other? That is, that is just not the British way of doing things. Well, we'll leave that to Harry Hun across the channel. Well, of course, I'm not allowed to do that, am I, Ian? Because 20 years old, I'm only old to vote and die for my country, but... Listen, if it's any consolation, heterosexuals aren't allowed to do it, unless it's done behind closed doors, um, with closed curtains, under the covers, with the lights off. I can't believe our attitude to sex. It's pathetic. Well, I think the country as a whole is so far in the dark ages that... It may as well be locked away and forgotten. Well, I heard some guy the other day, and they're going, oh, oh that was just some law and order debate, some kick the government's got on at the moment. And they were, um, they were going on about how they're going to clamp down on pornography. Why? Why don't you just get off, smeghead? I mean, half of them, I, I just don't believe how hypocritical this lot are. Yeah? Yeah. They're, they're the same, right, OK, first of all, no gays. All right, that's official from the government. No gays. None of these woofters. Number two. No sex. Number three, certainly no photographing it or videoing it. Oh, no. And then where do they go? Madam Whippy's knocking emporium. Or they go off and they sire uh, an illegitimate child. Oh, what a bunch of hypocrites. Don't preach your phony morality at me, Westminster, and get that one down, GCHQ. It's pretty radical. <laughs> well, it is something else pretty radical for you, which I think is rather good. Um, a direct quote from Stephen Fry, who was one of the guest speakers that this rally I went to last night in Parliament. Um, he was answering questions on um, when it's age consent 16, leave 16 year olds open to being preyed on, so to speak, by middle aged men in dirty or great raincoats. Yeah, most of them are probably members of parliament. <laughs> well, his answer was well, is the actual sexual age consent a charter for middle aged men to hang around the netball court? And what's wrong with that? It's a perfectly <laughs> fine occupation. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I mean, it boils down to. Well, hang on, what goes on in the straight community? I mean, it's no different to the way gay people work. I mean, if we're talking questions of morals, the heterosexual community's got abortion and divorce and... Um, we're not going to have either of those adultery. under the current, um, um, the current scheme of things, not unless medical science <laughs> takes massive leaps forward. So, you know, I, mean, I, think, I honestly think that people are frightened. I don't know what they're frightened of, but I've been there myself. I mean, I, I used to be really frightened of gays because I thought they were going to put their hand on me knee and that sort of thing. Um, when I was working, I used to work on the agricultural shows and um, used to get digs. Mm -hmm. And one night, I, I, I don't know how it happened, but I mean, I, I was sleeping with both eyes open because I was sharing the room with a gay bloke. And I was thinking, if he comes anywhere near me, he's leaving by that window over there, no problem. Uh, at the end of it, he's one of the kindest, nicest people I've ever met. It, it's, it's just a heterosexual myth. Yeah, I mean... That, that homosexuals want to get in your pants. It's a load of rubbish. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, most gay people are the most polite people that you can meet because they don't inflict themselves on you not in a sort of like sexual nature anyway I mean the behaviour might sort of get a flamboyant see in there but oh yeah but I mean I have the, I have the mickey taken out of me I, I, I've i got quite a lot of gay friends and if I turn up wearing my motorcycle leathers they look at me and say oh nice and that sort of thing and just take the mickey but I mean I, I'm, I am easy in no I don't know what I mean I, I'm comfortable in, the pre in, in uh, gay people's company I'm totally and utterly comfortable. Never meet a friendly lot of people anyway. Sorry? Never meet a friendly a lot of people. For sure. In fact, a mate of mine, uh, we were talking about him earlier in the show. In fact, I think I want paying for this. We've talked about him so much. <laughs> but we, um, he's, he's a, uh, a hypnotist. And I was saying, you want to do a gay club? I bet that would be hilarious. <laughs> um, I think some of the um, gay people themselves would be hilarious, actually. Anyway. Exactly. Well, you see, the, the thing that makes a stage hypnotist act are the, are, are the subjects, are the people that you get on stage. And I don't know. Get yourself down, get a few drama queens, literally drama queens, get them on stage, no problem. <laughs> I think they'd laugh it up, to be quite honest. <laughs> do, you, do you think that, that, that society is, is sort of becoming more tolerant? I do, and at the same time I think that society ought to mind its own business and let people live their lives instead of persecuting them and being hypocritical, telling them what they can and can't do, especially when they preach about things they know nothing about. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you see, I, I believe that for a, for a government to even think about legislation about your sex life is about as valid as, as, as me thinking about introducing legislation for religion. Yeah. You know, so, well, 
Full story, we decided to ban your Catholicism for you. Why? Why should I do that? If people want to do it, that's up to them. It's a personal freedom. I am sick and flipping tired of other people attempting to tell me and everyone else what to do and how to think. It really drives me balmy. I yeah. hate it. Because they've got no mandate to do that. What they're saying is, look at me, I'm great, me. I'm great and I live my life in a great fashion and you've got to do the same. Get lost. At the end of the day, the government's job is to run the country. And, and they're not doing that very no, well. No, I'd love to know when they're going to start, to be quite honest. <laughs> yes, give us a shout, we'd all like to know. <laughs> but one thing I'd also like to know is why it took a Conservative MP to propose the amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill to equal age consent after Labour and Liberal have milked gay votes for quite a few years on the promise of a few gay rights. It's cool not putting your head above the parapet. Um, it's like I, I totally and utterly believe that pornography, not child pornography, uh -huh. um, or animals or stuff like that, but you're under the mill pornography. There's a, there's a lot of myths about that. First of all, that it's violent. I have never seen, I, when I was in Amsterdam, obviously, um, I've never seen a violent porn movie. I've, see, I've seen, uh, I, I've gone to the cinema and watched movies that are far more violent than pornography. And yet you've got these people uh, and they won't stick their head up. They won't, they won't say, well, why don't we legalise it? Because if they do, the sun's going to say, pervert. Well, does anybody actually believe the sun anyway? And if they do, they'll be in dangerous ground, I think, well, aren't you? If you believe it, you're in serious, serious trouble. Listen, I've got to move on, Adrian. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, when is the boat? Um, well, the actual date will be sometime the week after next. Okay, well, we'll look out for that then. Holding that for quality, Ian. Okay, Dogie, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Ta -ra. Okay, ta -ra. There we go, Adrian. He's gay. He doesn't care. He knows it. And why, why should he care? He's bet uh, who's Petrina? This is Petrina. Good morning. Good How morning. Are you? Okay, I've never heard anything like this government. Uh, it's just They're hopeless, aren't they? What a load of rubbish. They're on the fly, though, with what was Eric was on about. Westminster flats being sold for uh, but promises of votes. Disgusting state of affairs, isn't it? I just don't understand what right anybody has to preach morals to me. I mean, I don't preach them to anybody else, so why should they preach them to me? No, I, I can't understand why that it's taken so long for them to bring this through anyway, and I hope that they vote correctly, that uh, they shouldn't uh, discriminate against them, because if two lesbian girls can, can get together at 16, why can't uh, the male uh, gay population do the same? I, I think they're discriminating unfairly. Ah, oh, well, I mean, that, that is the, the, the ultimate in heterosexual hypocrisy, isn't it? Yeah. It's Where it's you sit there, you know, all the lads together, hey, put the bluey on, hey, it's got two women together in it. Whoa. Yeah. What? <laughs> Blokes? Together? Puffs? Yeah, they won't oh, it's, it's so hypocritical. Anyway, what I was ringing about uh, was uh, Bev and the, the lady before. I've got two phone numbers for them if they'd like to grab a paper and pen. So, if you grab a paper and pen, we'll give you those numbers again at the end of the phone call. <laughs> It's my telephonist voice again. It's a very good telephonist voice, isn't Actually, it? I don't feel very well today. You don't sound very well, Patrina. We're all very worried about this. <laughs> well, I'm going to try um, Eric's remedy for stomach ulcer. What was it? Sherry and an egg, wasn't it? Or for a stomach ulcer? Yeah. Is that what you've got? Yeah, it's ulcerated stomach. Oh, dear. Hey, yeah. I, hope it, I hope it doesn't burst, anything nasty. Hey, if it does burst... If yeah, it does burst, look on the bright side for me, yeah, won't you? Well, you know, but if it does, if it... Um, if it does, would you mind being on the phone to me when it happens? Because it'd be great radio. <laughs> I've often thought, you know, all, you these, sadistic all these people, all these people selfishly dying. <laughs> we have so much of a thought for the midnight line and the ratings it could get if they came and did it live. Oh, good, the train is snuffed in. I'll be look. glad to hear the end of me on the show. Let's <laughs> look at it this way, Katrina. Bad news for you, great news for my ratings. So you can't go all through your life being selfish, young lady. <laughs> One thing I, that I'm not, and that's selfish. All these people popping the clubs, you've only got to look in the paper. Did they phone me just before they went? No, they didn't. No. <laughs> what were they thinking of? Anyway, back to these phone numbers, so oh, you get right, back sorry. to others. Uh, the DSS advice line is 0800 66 65 55. 66 65 55. Yeah. Or indeed, triple six, triple five. Well, thanks. <laughs> That's okay, it's just a different way of putting it, That's all. <laughs> and the Department of Health, which uh, handle questions as well, and they send all the forms out and give you the right information. And that is another free phone line, that is 0800 66 55 44. 
uh, I find that uh, these are a better help to you than uh, go and see somebody at your local DHS office uh, because they seem to have more information available to them than the person that's at the desk that's a bit mired and don't always give the correct information. The lady regards to having a, a social fund, I think that she should be entitled to it, particularly to repair a washing machine. So they will give the correct information out, and well, I just wanted to give you some... How numbers. about that? Just wanted you're to give these out. You're a kind and caring person. Well, they helped me out, they sorted out my insurance claim and, and me invalidity benefit, etc, etc. So uh, hopefully they will help both ladies and uh, anybody else that needs help like that. And they don't cost them anything, and uh, as I said, they've got all the information there, and they'll send the forms out to you, the, the relevant ones you want for your particular claims. Oh, that's lovely. Okay, You're a very lovely. kind person. I, I am, I'm lovely. I'm, just I'm also poorly today. Oh, well, we all hope you feel better. <laughs> I, I just, a thought just crossed my mind. We had um, a shareholders meeting at Beacon and WABC Towers today. Yeah. Um, I'm not one of them. No, no, but I am. So we um, we went to the um, we went to the meeting light, and um, we, uh, I mean it's common knowledge, you know, we, we've had a cash injection, and we've joined uh, a much larger group. Well, um, you said that a few weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 whichever way you look at it, it's good news for the company. But um, it isn't going to change your actual programs, is it? Well, no. Well, at least it wasn't. <laughs> Well, after the meeting. Well, no, I met the, uh, they, they introduced me to the uh, deputy chairman of the entire shebang. And I was just thinking, I was talking, oh yeah, we do a phone show. He said, well, you know, we don't, we don't really do phone shows in the, the rest of the group. And I said, well, you know, I mean, the thing is, it's 65% uh, audience, uh, you know, it's a winner. What I was angling after, between you and me, and the other 30 million people listening, was I was after getting the whole thing networked, you see, yeah. across the group. I think that'd be a really good idea. And uh, I was after that, like, so, you know, giving him the... I said, yeah, you know, if you're in the area tonight, you want to listen? I think, oh, man, what if you just listen to that? Why don't dead people phone me up? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yes, you can have this sort of sick conversation. Just blasting. think, if you, if you got this televised, they'd all be listening to me kicking the bucket, wouldn't they? <laughs> Well, I think somebody somebody needs to take the plunge and do it sometime. I think it's only fair. It doesn't matter how bad uh, things are. There's always uh, some bright sides to it, isn't it? Well, they really? used to say that to me. It doesn't matter. There's always somebody worse off than you. Yeah. And I, I remember once saying I could do with meeting them because I could do with a laugh. <laughs> Never mind. Hello, come in. Come in. <laughs> come in, Petrina. Was, uh, all right, well, listen, thank you for that because you've raised yourself off your, your sick bed. I have. And yeah. that's very kind to help others. Yeah, and if I don't ring you again, I'll kick the bucket. Yeah, well, make sure you, <laughs> listen, if you're going to croak it, make sure you do it between midnight and two, and then you give me a call. <laughs> okay, it's, then, it's bye. It's compulsive listening. <laughs> Bye. And uh, if you are listening, Mr Deputy Chairman, it's not always like this, sometimes it's quite sensible, actually. Len, good morning. Hello, mate. There I go saying it's quite sensible. Now we speak to Len. Good morning. <laughs> what can we do for you this morning, you old paranoid you? The old paranoid, get off. Nah, nah. I was, you know, two things upset me yesterday. Yeah? Yeah? One was the, the, the party political broadcast for the Tories that was on the television. What was that, was... the six o'clock news on the BBC? No, no, there was, there was a five-minute party political thing. And I've never heard such hypocritical... Rubbish, because you've stopped me swearing, haven't you? I have stopped you swearing, Len, because it's not very nice. That is, you know, because that's my second nature, especially when I talk about Tories. Strange, isn't it? And it? Anyway, that upset me. I was jumping up and down on my seat. And then, sort of, after I came on the radio, I, I spoke to you. You had this guy, what's his name, Wingnut? Mr W Nut, yes. Oh, he got me going the same as the Tories did. I think he totally has got no conception of what's going on in the, in the real world. Can I get an example? Yeah. There's a place advertising now in Telford. It's got a big advert in the, in the star, if you look in it, half a page, 40 jobs going. Well, I've got a mate that works there, and on night shift, yeah, he works 40 hours night shift, and he still has to claim family income supplement to bring him up from the poverty line. You don't want companies like that around here. Let him go back to Japan, or bloom in Italy, or whatever else they want to flame him go to. Why? Why? Yeah. Well, we can shut our borders and we make our own darn cars. Yeah, you see yeah. what I said last night? Back, in, back good in the money. real world. No, this, that is the real world. It's only, it's only politicians and people that are gaining out of it. So you, you reckon that Wingnut doesn't live in the real world? No, no. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. If you just hang on there, just a second. Now, I might cut both of you off, in which case we'll, uh, we'll go to a record. 
Oh, that's that one I want, isn't it? There we go. But, uh, he's here now. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello. Len. Hello. Hello. I don't live in the real world. Well, you don't if you're saying that people should start work for low wages. What's happening now is that men, you know, men, you and me, are being pushed out of the workplace. And somebody said, I think somebody said last night, that kids can go and earn 120 quid at 16 years of age. Well, they can't. But you, can't me. Keep, you can't keep a family at 120 quid a week. Well, I do it. I'm not much more than that. I'm married. I've got four kids, a car, a wife, and 120 pound a week. I take 165 pound a week, and I have to support a family on that. And you're not, claiming, you're not claiming family income supplement. I claim family credit. Yeah, but why should you? Do? Sorry. Why should you? You should be paid enough not to do that. Well, why? God, of course you should. Because I, mean, I believe in working for a living. I believe in getting up off my arse and working. Doesn't matter what I get paid. I enjoy my job. I enjoy getting out of bed and coming to work and working. Actually working. And it doesn't matter what job I'm doing. I've been a baker for 16 years. It doesn't yeah, matter what your labour, which is the only thing you've got to offer and to sell, is worth um, good money. I mean, why, sh why should you why should you sell, you sell yourself short? Well, I, I, oh, you tell me where I can go and get a job for a lot more. Precisely. Because that's what Ian said. No, but that's, the, that's, with the baking, that, that's been in the, within the baking trade for years. But it's nothing to do with what we were on about was people. There is jobs out there. A lot of these low-paid jobs are jobs where they're not doing anything. <laughs> well, I wouldn't tell me, mate, that because he's always I know, people, I know a lad who, who, who left a job, £120 a week he was taking home, and all he was doing was sitting there packing bags of sugar. That's not work. What do you want? What do you want for 120 quid a week? So he left there, he went somewhere else earning twice as much, and he had to graft and he packed it in because he couldn't, uh, he couldn't hack it. Well, I mean... Oh. It's bloody rubbish. When I, so he when goes I, back on the door, so it's keeping him now. Oh, well, well, I quote again, in 1967, when I was working, I'll tell you where I was working, Bird's Eye, yeah, which is a manual job. I was a cold storeman or a driver, a shunter, with a class one, and I was getting 50 quid a week. Now, you equate that out on what, how the cost of living has gone up, and it's more than £160 a week I'd have to earn to earn that. Yeah, well, this is it, isn't it? This well, is what this is all the problem. A lot yeah, of people have priced themselves. No, we haven't outpriced ourselves. Well, of course you have. Well, all right then. I went for a job as a warehouse manager in Woolworths, yeah? Then, uh, just past Cheltenham, about three or four months ago. Now, warehousing is my second nature. I know it inside out and upside down. There were three wagons tipping on the loading bay, yeah? Yeah. And you'd have, I told you in this at the time, you'd have needed a degree in Chinese to work out what was in those cases. So? All of it was imported stuff, not made in this country. Well, why? Because the stuff they churn out, it's because they're not bleeding really idle, and it's going to be most of them. The stuff no, they churn out is not crap. At all. Not at not well, at all. Of course it is. Of course it's, it's, it's been known for years. A British car is rubbish for a start. The Rover. That's why Rover is the best-selling car in the world at oh, the moment. One, one company out of how many that used to be around? Well, I don't know. All where the have Japanese they all gone? Where have, they all, where have they all gone? And why have they all gone? So why have the Japanese people? Why have the Japanese factories come over here to have the cars built? Because they can produce a because they produce a better car, I should imagine a better quality car that lasts longer. Well, you just told me that the British work is no good. Cheaper. The British work is no good. He couldn't, you know, he, he couldn't make anything. So they're not getting paid. But, but the then, Japanese. But then, hold on a minute. Then, if um, <coughs> if the the goods that you say were in the warehouse were all imported, you have got to ask yourself the question: Why were they, were they imported? And you might reach the conclusion, rightly or wrongly that they were imported because they were cheaper to import than if they were made here because your average British worker demanded too much. Oh, you, you think you think £3.20 an hour is too much? What, what, was your, what, was you, what was you on on an hour there? What, mate? Always. That's I never, got, I never got the job, actually. That was an interview I was on, but to be quite honest... No, after... oh, you never actually did the job, then. I mean, as a warehouse well, manager... As a warehouse, you know, as a warehouse manager... What would you be doing? You wouldn't Maybe. be doing none of the physical labour, really, <coughs> would you, as a manager? Oh, I've done it. Yes, I, I can understand that you've done it, but, I mean, you wouldn't have been doing it. No, I'd have been so, organised. So, uh, right, if they paid you £150 a week to stand there and tell somebody else to do it, don't you think that's a, a pretty good enough wage? For actually not doing anything. To be quite honest, I wouldn't. if it was £150 a week, I wouldn't have got out of bed for it. Oh, well, well, well there you go. That's what's wrong with the British working people, really, isn't it? That's the trouble. A lot of them. I wouldn't bother getting out of bed for that. Well, they no. get thirty pound a week on the dole. They subsidise it by working on the side, and so they don't want to get out of bed and go to, go and get a job. They're too bloody bow and idle. Most I know I've had it. I've actually experienced it. I've been. <coughs> a man, I was a manager for nine years. I was sick to death. That's part of the reason why I packed my last job in. So everybody should everybody should be quite happy to work for a pittance wage. Yeah. It's not. It depends what job they're doing. 
If you're going down a coal mine and drafting like a drafting for, like an idiot for 40 hours a week, then you should be on good money. But if they're just sitting in a little factory putting two screws together, which, all right, it's a mundane job. I wouldn't do it, but I would if I had to. If I was, if I if I lost this job and I had to go somewhere else, I'd do it because I I want to work. I've always worked. I don't think actually. Wing nuts. I don't think you're, we're in a position to talk about it because we don't know. And even me, and I, I, I had quite a good job with a, with a, a national a freight company. But even we were not um, allowed to know profits. Yeah, we didn't know boardroom decisions. We were told that's your budget. Sure. That's the way you get the job done. It isn't your you job. You go out and do it. Yeah, but but at a certain level, that's all we were allowed to to, to learn. We, we we couldn't we couldn't grasp anything more than that. Nobody told us how many, uh, what the rates for storage, well, I know what the rates what for the handling rate. were. I mean, you can work out how much you sell cakes for. I know roughly what the rate, I've been in the job too. I've only ever worked at small family places. I wouldn't work in a big place. Yeah, Unless but you can, work, you can work out if you put out 10,000 cakes tonight and they're going to fetch, I don't know, 40 pence. You can soon work out what, what they're bringing back, aren't you? Oh, well, yes, your, obviously. Knock your distribution costs off and everybody else's wage. You can soon work it out. But when you're in a multinational, you, it's a bit more difficult when you're putting sort of half a million cases or a million cases out a week. And everybody's got overhead. Well, yeah. But at yeah. the end of the day, if, you, if you're a labourer... I don't think... I don't... I mean, I've seen... In fact, at, I know two factories now. One's a brand new factory that supplies seats, and another factory uh, that I know well is uh, is Leyland. And I can honestly say at British Leyland, they're probably on 30% more than they're on in the other factory. But they can afford to put out a decent car. Maybe. If you, if you pay pretty much, you, you get monkeys. There's an old saying. Yes, but at the same time, what are they being paid to do? Exactly. Maybe it's a job you could teach monkeys to do in some cases. Thank Listen, you. girls. Thank you very much. Listen, thank you very much for that. I sprung it on Wingnut. He didn't know that was going to happen. So, you <laughs> sprung it on me as well. Well, yeah, yeah, true. All right. I sprang it on both of you. So, um, thanks for that, girls. Very good, at, very good at springing. I sat, there, I sat there and listened. I did. Just one question. Yeah? About the government. Yes. Here's a big quick finger from the wingy. Instead of them all resigning one at a time, why they just resign the lot of them all together? I'm with you there, on that wingy. Thank you very much. I think we all agree. <laughs> Ta-ra. Good night. Are you cutting both of us I'm off? afraid so, Len. All right, I'm going to move on. Ta-ra. Ta-ra. There we go. I thought I'd try it, you know. Uh, all sorts of capabilities, this uh, switchboard, which I don't actually use. The lines have gone balmy, so somebody obviously said something somewhere that um, you either agreed with or didn't disagree with. We'll, uh, we'll see how many calls we can get through. Next on the lines, um, who've we got? We've got, I can't remember which order I put them on, I was so riveted. Uh, I think this is, is this uh, Dave, is it? I think I can Ah, got you, Dave. What yeah. can we do for you? Well, I just thought I'll bring you up to date, then I'll have a nut uh, over the unemployment like everybody else. Um, I found up about four months ago. Um, How subsidence? That's it, that's it. Because like you were saying earlier on, you um, a state agent. Now, if, if I remember rightly, you bought a house and it was surveyed and they didn't tell you about the subsidence. I bought a house nine years ago. Uh, had a surveyor come in. What, there was only three things a matter. Cracked uh, ceiling in back bedroom, uh, uh, loose slate, one loose slate, and a uh, manor cover cracked. Um, about well, it's been five years now. Uh, I had a second mortgage, I had another surveyor come in, nothing come out of the house. About two months later, I put the property up for sale. Uh, somebody else's surveyor come in and put up subsidence on the um, side of the house. Uh, I had to move out for 11 weeks, it cost uh, £30,000 to have the house structurally put right. But now I'm suing the surveyor, see? Right, because they, they, there was no recourse for you, was there? Exactly. Um, but the problem is, is trying to get surveyors, trying to sue them. Uh, it's practically impossible. What I said to you before, if you, unless you had an independent surveyor, like, see how it works is, you pay the bills to have a surveyor, but they work on behalf of the building societies, not you. So you're paying for the building society? Exactly. That's very nice of you. Yeah, but um, they, they change the law, but it's very hard to get them. But uh, it's been now uh, five years, or uh, nearly six years, of uh, trying to get the surveyors. But uh, up to date it is, I had a um, telephone call off my solicitor, um, because, uh, you know, it's gone on and gone on. Uh, now I've got, I'm in court the 8th of February. But before that, me and my wife have got to go and see a shrink to see if it's uh, caused any 
psychologically damaged. It's okay, I can pronounce it because I've got a degree in it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we've got to go next next week and see uh, a string. <laughs> so so the, the um, ongoing battle is still ongoing? Yes. Okay. Listen, I've got to move on, but when you go to court, yep. will you let us know what happens? Yep. I'd also be quite interested to find out whether or not the shrink, and I, I think that's, that's probably the correct terminology. Uh, bear in mind, I've never met a shrink who was, who was sane. I've never met a psychologist or a psychiatrist who was in any way sane. Uh, bear that in mind when you go and see him. But let us know what he says as well. Yep. All right, mate? Yep. Yep. And the other thing is, I'm unemployed like everybody else, um, and I think uh, we're not uh, talking around his head. Because the thing is, um, I'm a skilled man, say. I've I done a five-year apprenticeship, or probably the only, one of the only two for it. Uh, I've done a five-year apprenticeship, um, and the, pr uh, the problem is companies have dropped the wages. And if you get to work, you get to work for a wage to live and to enjoy life, not to exist. I mean, if you're taking um, £150 a week or £160 a week, fair enough. But if you're taking £120 a week, that's not good to know about it. And that's what they're paying, you reckon? Well, I know, because my last job, I went to Christmas, I went down there, um, and they dropped the wages by £20 a week. But, I mean, I'll tell you if I won't go back in there. Not now, because sedate and whatever. I've decided I'm going to have a go on my own at summit. Uh, I think that that's probably the way to go. I mean, if you've, if you've got it in you to do it, I would say do it. But the thing is, uh, this, they say this government to help you. They don't help you. Oh, no, do no, nobody will help you. No, you've got to do it on your own behalf. All the way. Even finances. Um, cause I've been trying to um, chambers of commerce and all this lot. Because they get you in one hand and take it off you in the other. Sounds like every other government I've ever exactly. known, yeah? That's yep. the one. That yep. would be the same government then, yes? Yes. Well, good luck with it, whatever you think you're doing. Well, um, I'm starting it, but I'm going to do it on the side, first of all, to see how it goes. Like everybody else, you've got to do things what you wouldn't want to do, but that's life. Well, as, as Ian Perry once thought in the bath, <laughs> in fact yesterday, um, it doesn't matter how many strings you've got on your bow, you can only fire one arrow. Yep. Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom from the Perry, that. Listen, good luck with it, mate. Yep, I'll Oops. keep you in touch. Okie dokie. And uh, all the rest, anyway. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers, Dave. Yep. Ta. There you go. I mean, am I alone in thinking that estate agent surveyors, in fact, the entire process of buying a house is just orchestrated towards taking money out of your pocket and put it into estate agents and solicitors and surveyors? <laughs> it's too hard. I mean, I'm, I'm in the process of looking at the moment, and it's just too hard. Who's next? Uh, uh, I think we've got Neville next, probably. Is this Neville? Yeah, we got Neville here. Hello, Neville. Yeah, hello. Hello, what can we do for you? Yeah, this uh, happy day. Just a couple of little points I wanted to bring up. Um, child support agency. I was... Uh, are you still there? Yeah, sorry, my hand uh, had just automatically stretched yeah, out in, always, in, a, in always a salute. Really quiet here for a minute. No, it's just you said child support agency, I was checking my conscience. Yes, yeah, child support agency. Uh, I was trying to get in touch with these people today, because they sent me a bill, and uh, it, it says on the letter here, it gives you the phone number and says get in touch with us and we'll be pleased to help. <laughs> By help, they mean divest you of any money you might happen to have. Oh, well, sort of, yeah. But anyway, I was, uh, I was on the phone, ringing away, and uh, it was about lunchtime. And eventually they answered the phone, and they put me through to an answering machine. Always which, which is, we're uh, un unable to help you at the moment. And I'll leave your name and number and we'll call you back. So I thought, oh, I'm not happy that. So I'll get on the phone again, wait another half hour for them to answer it. Back on the switchboard. Uh, oh, they must all be out at lunch. Hold on, I'll have a look around and see if I can find anyone for you. So she goes around all the phones, you can hear her ringing this and ringing that. Uh, sorry, can't get in touch with anyone. You'll have to ring back after two o'clock when they all come back from lunch. Five past two, ample time for them to get back. I'll spend the next two hours on the phone trying to get through. Still nothing? Still nothing. You I'll know, be all out counting your money, Neville. Yes, fight out. Uh, second point. 
I'd well, like... How did you leave it? I mean, you just. Oh, oh I just left it. I, I had to go to work. I'll yeah, tell you what, they'll be, they'll be quick enough, won't they? If they, if they, uh, if you don't pay them. Well, oh, they will be. Yeah. But unfortunately, they haven't had anything yet. But, they're, but they're after it. They want a uh, hundred and five quid a week out of me. Hundred and five. Hundred and five. Yeah, and that's without actually having an, uh, an assessment. They don't actually know what I earn. I was going to say, what are you, Richard Branson's uh, right hand man? This, this is just off, off the top of the head. You know, they, uh, they, they reckon they sent me a form out, which uh, I didn't receive. And so they've, they've made this interim assessment, which, according to them, I can afford to pay hundred and five pounds just like that, you know. But, uh, well, that's nice of them, isn't it? Very nice of them, yeah. But, but second thing, uh, I was going to mention... I was going to mention... Uh, the effect that unemployment has on people who have a job, like me. Uh, in the West Midlands, round there, whether you know it or not, being a scouse... <laughs> Birkenhead, please. Uh, Birkenhead, the, then. The, pos, the posh side of the water. Uh, uh, we used to have the best bus service in the whole country. Uh, and uh, they'll, they'll have you believe that we still have. That's our, our little silver and blue things that you see floating about. Which, uh... Oh, those are buses, are they? Uh, that's the one, yeah. Um, unfortunately, or, or fortunately to have a job, I suppose, but unfortunately I happen to, I happen to work for these people. And, uh, since privatisation, which is the, the you know, government ideas, uh, privatise this and that and the other, it's all been trimmed this, trimmed that, trimmed the other. So, so, so we've lost, uh, we started off with about 6,000 staff, and we trimmed down there to about 4,000. And there's only the drivers left to pay about with. And as soon as they develop a computer that yeah. can drive a bus... <laughs> well, I'll be on my bike, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but they wouldn't have the same sort of degree in sarcasm, would they, Neville? No, that's right, yeah. But do, you, do you get the twirlies? I get the twirlies. I thought, yeah. somebody told me what a twirly was a couple of weeks ago. I thought it was hilarious. Oh, well, 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 well. For anybody who doesn't know, it's an old age pensioner who gets on a, a bus with a I'm restricted... A twirly, yeah. yeah, with a restricted <laughs> bus pass and have a twirly. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. But anyway, as I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted. Sorry, I'll yeah. shut up. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, tr we've trimmed our engineering stuff to save money, and we've trimmed our traffic stuff. This is why you won't see an inspector anymore, anyway. I'll break her, you know. I hate you, Butler. That's the lag. Yeah, he's gone, yes. He's been replaced by a little computer. And uh, we've turned on us now. Unfortunately, we can't trim us, because we still need people to drive the buses. Well, we've, we've decided on this great idea to trim our wages. Uh, we've uh, we've suddenly come up with we'd like you drivers to take a third cut in wages and uh, talk about some silly bonus scheme after, after you've accepted it. Uh, which uh, so if they were honest about it, what they would say is we actually want you to pay less money. We're just trying to think of a way of disguising it. That's right, exactly. Yeah, because um, they, they, they want to introduce this bonus thing. But once it, once it's there, once you've accepted all this all this new thing, a bonus is a bonus, and it can be quite easily withdrawn, can't it? It's, Oh, for sure. You know, it's not a written down on paper thing, it's just out uh, of the goodness of their hearts, they'll give us a bonus. Do you not have a strong union? Uh, we did have a strong union, but... Yeah, then Thatcher smashed it. Oh, old, old, old Mrs T, you know, sorted them out. And, unfortunately, the union blokes all, all tend to be, like, 50s, early 60s, pushing their... Uh, pushing retirement. And keeping their heads down, Keeping their heads chance. down, thinking, well, they've been paying everybody else off, so, uh... You know, maybe we're next, we'll get a, you know, a quick backhand and we'll be out the back door. And we're not hearing anything off our union at all. Well, that's what you're paying for, isn't it? It's what we're paying for, yeah. And, uh, first thing we heard, we had a, we had a meeting yesterday about, about this, this new proposal that's come up. And our union are kindly negotiating it for us. How very kind. Yeah. So they haven't said, stick it. They said we'll negotiate it. We'll negotiate it, but, uh, well, according to them, they've, they've got to negotiate it. It's been put forward to them, so they've got to negotiate it. No, they don't. Uh -huh. They well, could resist it. Well, well, this is what we thought. If, uh, if you'd like a freelance union negotiator, I'm very reasonable. No, I'll, I'll send for you. I'll, I'll have a word with them, you know.